All right, uh, greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is uh, courts and ju- courts and the judicial process. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, tonight in my lecture. We're going to be talking about chapter thirteen from our textbook. Now, our textbook is uh, criminal courts, uh, structure, process, and issues uh, by Champion Hartley and Rabe. Um, I'm going to be talking to you from the third edition. It's kind of the it's unofficial. Uh, book for the class, but the official book is the fourth edition. So I'm just going to be talking, out, glossing over a lot of these um, these uh, issues and these um, these topics um, in uh, in this chapter. So do remember, and I'll say it again: um, my lecture is nothing more than a supplement to your reading. So it is your duty to read and prepare for class and and go over these chapters yourself. Um, I'm just supplementing. I can't read everything for you and and spoon feed you everything. So. Uh, you do have a duty to read this chapter. Um, will I go over every every word in this chapter? No, I won't. I'm just going to go over the, the major issues and talk about it from the standpoint, from my standpoint, um, and what it means to me, what it means to the criminal justice system. So let's begin. Chapter 13. Uh, we have uh, chapter 13 is entitled Diversion, Alternative Dispute Resolution, and Specialty Courts. Um, as an introduction, those thing, all those things are very important. Uh, that is the uh, alternative dispute resolution, spe- uh, diversion, and specialty courts. The main thing that these um, th- that these three things do is they uh, limit or they make they actually make the court system way more efficient. Um, as I said before in earlier chapters, well over ninety percent of uh, cases. And criminal court are, are do not go to trial. Um, and even with ninety, even if one with only five plus five or less percent of cases in the criminal court system going to trial, we're still backlogged. Um, it still still takes cases a long time to actually go to trial. Uh, so one thing that makes it even more efficient uh, is what we call alternative dispute resolution, or in these diversion programs and specialty courts. Um, it, it, they do a couple of things. They keep things, even when they are prosecuted, um, they keep them from being necessarily criminalized, uh, to the highest extent. So that means they take, they, they take the totality of the circumstances of the facts, who the per, who the defendant is, who the victim is. And they say, Hey, even though this person is technically guilty of this crime, would it be just, um, to prosecute them and criminalize their conduct to the fullest extent? Um, maybe this person needs help and that's why they're committing crime. So and in the certain situations, this person may be a first time offender and it may be a relatively um, not a, a non-serious crime that they, they, they've uh, they're accused of committing. Um, and the criminal court system, once again, because even though, um, you know, if taken from me, the criminal justice justice system doesn't have much of a heart, but sometimes they do. Um, they say, hey, is it right for us to prosecute and criminalize um, this person's conduct and their first offender, they're relatively young, never been in trouble before, why Why prosecute them? Why not give them a second chance? Uh, so that that's uh, when we're talking about first offender or, uh, or other diversion programs. So uh, first we're going to talk about decriminalization. Um Decriminalization, in a nutshell, um, does not mean that they're legalizing something. So, and uh, I believe in Washington D.C., they have decriminalized the possession of marijuana. It doesn't mean that the marijuana has been legalized. It just means they're not treating the conduct as criminal. What that means, and, and I, I know you guys are saying, what's the difference? Um, the difference is it can be illegal, but um, if the cops pull you, if the cops, you know cite you for having it it's not going to go to criminal court it's just going to be a matter of you paying a fine just like getting a parking ticket uh so in other words you're not going through the court system you're not being penalized as a criminal for possessing marijuana anymore so it has been decriminalized there's a difference between decriminalized and um and legalizing if they legalize it that means hey you can have it there's there's no fine or anything no punishment you can get for possessing it um, decriminalization means that it is still illegal, but we're just not going to treat it like a criminal offense. We're going to treat it like, just like, uh, just like, uh, parking in a handicap, um, is not criminal, but it is illegal. So if you park in a handicap, you're going to get a ticket. Now you have to go downtown and pay it. Um, now it doesn't mean that you don't have the right to, uh, 
to challenge it. So you still have right to, the right to challenge certain things, just like you have the right to challenge a ticket. Uh, you can still go to a hearing and be heard on it, but it, but your your conduct is not criminalized. In other words, you're not going to be punished criminally for it. So whatever happens is not going to go on a criminal record. It's just going to be a matter. It's almost like a, a civil fine payment. Um, that's one example. Now I'm going to read the book's definition of decriminalization. All right, uh, decriminalization or to, de to decriminalize um, legislative action whereby an act or omission formerly criminal is made non-criminal without punitive sanctions. What that means is you're not going to be punished. In other words, you may have to pay a fine, but they're not any criminally punitive sanctions. So you're not going to jail. That's not even going to read or show up on your criminal record. It's just like getting a parking ticket. So. That's decriminalization, and, and that's a lot of what's going on now in certain jurisdictions. Um, that's why you have to look at the verbiage. So when you read it, when you read things, oh, in D.C., marijuana is uh, illegal now. No, it's not legal. It's just decriminalized. There's a difference. Know the difference. There's some places where marijuana may be perfectly legal, um, like California, Denver. That's why they have, excuse me, that's why they have dispensaries where you can sell it, stuff like that. But, um... In certain other jurisdictions, it's not legalized. It's just decriminalized, meaning they're not going to, you know, throw you to the wolves. They're just going to say, hey, pay a fine for having it. Keep it moving. So that's decriminalization. Then you have ADR or what we call alternative dispute resolution. Um, these are th this is nothing more than a means of uh, resolving disputes without going to trial. In other words, you know, the the, the I guess the. Last resort for settling a dispute in the criminal justice system is a trial. That's it. Um, if you, you want to settle that dispute, you got to go. You're going to trial. Um, alternative dispute resolutions are just what they sound like. Alternative uh, means of disposing of disputes. So rather than going all the way to trial, um, we're in, we're just going to see if we can settle it without it going there. Um, so that's what alternative dispute resolutions are, stuff like mediation and arbitration. Um, and those help clear the system as well. They, 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 they uh, reduce the backlog of, of trials um, in the criminal justice system. Um, then we have restorative justice, which is also a means. Um, it's a means of restoring a victim. It's, 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 it's a, a form of arbitration or mediation where a victim and a, and a defendant uh, sit across from each other or have a, some type of mediator where the victim can be made made whole and the the and the the actual defendant um, can sometimes be made whole as well. Uh, so it, sometimes it can fix both people. It can restore the victim and it can fix the defendant because what you got to realize is some people commit crimes not because they're bad people, but because they're they're because their environment they're set with the set with the they they have to make a uh, the best of a whole bunch of bad choices. Uh, and sometimes the choice they made was a bad choice to everyone else, but not being in their position, we don't realize that was actually the best choice they had, right? Um, you know, you have a mother that goes in the food line. Her kids are home. She got five kids. She's a single mother because of the, 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 the how many children she has. It's hard for her to get child care, hard for her to maintain employment, and she's down to her wit's end. Uh, pockets are empty. Um, and she has to feed these kids. These kids are crying. Some of them are very young. Um, and she says, well, we got to eat tonight. I don't got food stamps or I ran out of this and that. I need to go to the grocery store and I'm going to steal some peanut butter and jelly and bread. I'm going to steal not, you know, some milk, some things that are needed in my house. I'm going to try to make it out of the store. She gets caught, right? Um, now, she's not a bad person. She was just put in a situation where she had to make um, a tough decision. Um, so, and she made, you know, of course, some, in certain situations, if she decides not to feed her kids, some would say, oh, that's very selfish. She didn't do it. She, she, didn't, she didn't go as hard in the paint as she could for her kids. So, therefore, she's a bad mother. Why ain't them cheering eating? Um, so um, she can be, it can be bad. So that's the, you know, and then even if she, even if it's not about that, as a mother, you want your kids to eat. Uh, so it's like, you know, two bad alternatives. My kids go hungry or I face possibly being uh, arrested and going to jail, but uh, I'm going to do whatever it takes to feed my kids tonight. Right. So um, 
that's an example of how sometimes people, they're not bad. They just have to be restored. Um, so then, you know, one of the parts of restorative justice is we can sometimes figure out, well, um, what led this person not to being in this economic, socioeconomic place? You know, was it lack of schooling? Did they drop out? What can we do to put them in a situation where they can have more earning potential? Let's fix this person. Let's not only restore the victim, which, of course, that's the main thing it's about. But if we can, how about let's try to restore um, the defendant uh, or, or the person that uh, is alleged to have perpetrated the crime? So. Uh, then you have, of course, uh, to be an arbitrator or a mediator, you must meet qualifications, usually a state qualifications. Uh, they, don't, they just don't pick up uh, Joe Blow off the street and say, hey, can you arbitrate or mediate? Uh, you have to be certified. And depending on what state you're in, you, you know, that, that determines uh, whether or not you can be certified. Some arbiters are lawyers. Uh, a lot of them are. Um, some mediators are lawyers and well, and, you know, in certain situations, a mediator doesn't have to be a lawyer, but it's just a means of, uh, talking to both sides or kind of, kind of going to trial without necessarily going to trial. It's not a real judge. It's an arbiter. Um, and they're making a decision. They're saying that this is just, um, so, um, victim offender reconciliation. Um, and uh, of course, in there is, uh, now what I, what do I say? So the defendant has all the rights. When I say the rights, I mean the constitutional rights. If you're a defendant in the criminal court system, the Constitution of the United States, those bills of rights, the 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 uh, the Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, and Sixth Amendment, those were for you. Um, so that search and seizure is for someone that's going to be charged with a crime or just being charged with a crime or being investigated. Fifth Amendment right to not incri not incriminate yourself or not you know the right to not talk at all. Um, and not not be forced to testify. That's a defendant's right. And uh, the right to cross examine and, and face witnesses against you and the right to due process. Um, that is a Sixth Amendment right that is also a defendant's rights. But um, the victims in these cases have rights, too. They're just not in the, the, the Bill of Rights. There are certain rights the court affords them. The court affords victims of crimes uh, the right to be heard. Um, they, they get to have a voice as well. If, if, if someone, you know, goes in your house and steals your flat screen TVs, um, you get to come to court. You get to fill out a victim's impact statement to say how it affected you. Now, my house is broken into. I never feel I'll never feel safe again. It affects my peace of mind. My TVs cost this much money. They were damaged. I'll never get them. I need my money back. Um, all that matters. Victims get to be heard. Um, but with victim offender reconciliation, it's an, uh, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for victims and offenders to sit down and talk about it. Um, so, and I think sometimes that helps because, uh, a lot of times, even when we go back to that, that mother in the grocery store, um, sh she has tunnel vision. She's worried about her, she's worried about her problem, right? Um, her issue. Um, so because she's worried about her issue and her kids, she may not be thinking about the issue of the shop owner, the person that owns that store that now has to worry about inventory and making ends meet for his family. So sometimes you can adjust the person's thinking um, to say, hey, the next time you get in the pinch, how about you ask? You tell someone, hey, I got issues. I'm trying to feed my kids um, rather than taking because that, that shop owner, that store owner, you never know. They may be at their wits end and financially trying to keep a business together, trying to pay employees. Um, so um, reconciliation allows both parties to really uh, talk to each other and learn from each other. Um, then we have pretrial diversion. Um, the book talks about the history and the fun, you know, functions and factors influencing diversion um, and also criticisms. But what I'll say, the, the main function of diversion is to keep... Um, a lot of these cases from going to trial, keeping them out of court. Um, one example of a of a pretrial of a diversion program is what we call first offender programs. Um, that means they're normally given to first first offenders. So usually to, to qualify, you have to be a first offender. It doesn't mean that it always has to be that way. Um, but for the most part, especially in Guilford County, you have first offender programs. Um, one of my best buddies runs one. It's called the Outer Limits Program. I got some other friends. There's the Behavior Concepts Program, the, in the Interventions Drug Program. But they are designed uh, to allow these cases to be diverted away from the trial path. So if you're a first offender, you come to court, you're guilty of sin, you had a dope on you, or you stole, you, we got you on tape stealing from that store, 
um, you you can still qualify for some mercy. You know what I mean? So we're not going to prosecute you. The, the DA determines that the case is not that important. We're not going to uh, back up the trial log, uh, the trial, um, you know, the trial log uh, with this case. So because this person's the first offender and because what they did was relatively unimportant compared to all the other stuff in court, um, we're going to divert this case. We're going to send it to a pretrial diversion program. Uh, usually in these programs, there's, there's, there's a fee that has to be paid and, you know, that community service that has to be done. And it's all supervised through the program. Um, also, there are things to learn. There, there, there may be um, what we call, because um, not, it's not usually um, uh, medical or uh, what do you call it? Now, now, I'm, now I'm at a loss for words. But it's, it's usually, um, what do you call it? When we have... Uh, who Lord, man, lost words. Um, it is. Uh, I'm trying to think of the word. It, it's it's teach. It, it's based upon teaching you. Uh, curriculum based. That's my word. It's not. Uh, it's curriculum based, and it's not clinical. Those are the two words I was looking for. I lost them. Um, so it's not clinical in the fact that they can diagnose you and treat you or anything like that for a, a mental issue. Like, why do you steal? Um, or why do you use drugs? But it is curriculum based, meaning they can teach you alternatives. Um, you know, in other words, give you, at least show you that there's a different path and a different way of thinking. Uh, so sometimes you have to do that. Um, but in these programs, if you get done if you, if you do, and you do everything you're supposed to do in the program, you come back to court and your case gets dismissed. Uh, so that is an alternative to going, that is an alternative to going to trial because let's say you do go to trial, just like flipping the coin, it's a 50% chance you lose at trial. Um, and, uh, I know people think, oh, I want my day in court. But if they really looked at court, now I'm in court every day because I'm an attorney, but they really, really understood court and watched, especially district court, where you have uh, judges who are elected officials. They are politicians, so just, you know, and they're not even policy-making politicians, so it's even worse. You're making decisions as a politician, um, and being a politician especially, and it's not it's not supposed to be bipartisan in North Carolina or partisan politics in, in, uh, for judicial elections in North Carolina, but it is because we know the party of the person that's, run, that's running. Um, even though they don't run on a straight ticket, we know this person's a Democrat or Republican. So you run on some type of a campaign slogan or promise, right? Um, and then you're in court and, you know, you could be kind of compromised as a judge. Uh, so as an as a defense attorney, I try my best to keep my clients from having to face a compromised criminal justice system in certain situations where even though they may not be guilty at all, that doesn't mean they, they won't be found guilty um, because sometimes there is a tad bit of unfairness uh, and um, what I would say inaccuracy in the criminal justice system. So uh, not just calling them compromise or, or, you know, really, you know, crapping on judges, but they're also humans. They, they fail to see certain things. And sometimes as a human, you're on the bench and you now have to be one human that's acting as 12 as a judge and 12 juries making a decision in one person's head. Um, sometimes you, you don't see everything right. I had a client one time that was literally on tape, not committing a crime. We, we watched it. My client was over here. Um, and the, the, the thing happened and we saw, I'm like, my client didn't do it. Look, and, and what's crazy the judge, I don't know if the judge wasn't fully paying attention to everything, but the judge missed it. Um, and my client was convicted, even though, and, and you know, we had, we, we were able to appeal and, and, you know, we went through the process of appealing to uh, Superior Court for trial de novo, which means new trial. And we eventually got what we wanted, but look what my client had to go through because of, of human error. So it's not just, I want to say they're dirty, right? Um, some of them are, it's political, but, um, is the, the the system is compromised not just because of the people are bad and judges are bad people, but because judges are just like everybody else. They're human and they make mistakes. So there's all there's always that chance for error. So with um with these uh pretrial diversion programs and options, a lot of times I can keep my client in a place where they can control the outcome. Um and that's the main thing I want my clients to understand. Uh, I'm not pushing you into doing this because, you know, I think you did it. I'm pushing you into doing it because if you do it, you don't have to worry about whether you did it or not. You just take care of pay this program fee, do this. And guess what? You control the outcome. You're literally 
um, almost purchasing a dismissal of your case as opposed to going to trial and not knowing whether you're, whether it's going to be dismissed or whether you're going to be acquitted or not. Um, so it just it it, allow, it gives us that option, and most of my clients take that. Once I explain it to them, like, hey, you want to go home today? You want to you want a conviction? Okay, well let's do this. A uh, hush, do this. Um, so uh, that's how it goes. Um, so uh, once again, diversion programs keep cases from having to go all the way to the end. It get it it it, it uh, kind of un, it uncrowds, I guess, lack, for lack of a better word, the court system. Uh, so. Uh, let me see. Factors that influence diversion. The book talks about that. Of course, it's all about prosecutorial discretion. As prosecutors, they have the, the utmost discretion in what they're going to prosecute and what they're not going to prosecute. Of, co- of course, as a defense attorney, I'm in there as well. I'm in their ear. Oh, don't do this. Don't do that. We're always in their ear. They get, we get on their nerves. They get on ours. But uh, we're trying to get them to see that there is an alternative to prosecuting cases uh, in certain situations. Um, but it's really up to them and they have to think about things like, you know, lack of criminal record, um, the actual facts of the case, whether or not there's a sculptory or inculpatory evidence. And then they have to also think about efficiency and whether they're going to have time to prosecute this case. Now think about stuff like that. So all those factors come in. Um, then we have, uh, other, uh, non-criminal Sanctions that go that fall a little bit short of diversion programs, but there are diversions like, uh, you know, saying, you know, sometimes I have a client that might get charged with weed and, and I say, hey, can my client just do community service? We bring a letter back next court date saying they did community service. We get dismissed. All right, cool. Um, did they have to go through a program? No, but did they have to do something to earn that dismissal? Yes. Um, that That's an a, a example of diverting without necessarily going through a program. Uh, or even uh, certain situations coming to court prepared to pay restitution to a client. I mean, to a a victim. I've had clients that literally walked in uh, the per you know on the warrant. It says this person, um, you know, this was an injury to personal property case. I think it was two roommates that got in a fight, and I think he broke old boy's PlayStation. Right. Uh, so the guy wanted. Hey, I want my five hundred dollars. You know. Okay. Um. So I told my client like based upon the warrant, they talk about what the PlayStation's worth. Come to court with this amount of money. I'm willing to bet you, um, if if they're there and ready to go that day, I'm willing to bet you this person. But I'm cool with taking that money to get me a new PlayStation. I don't care what happens. You can dismiss it, and that's exactly what happens. So sometimes being ready to walk into court, make ready to make a person whole, or doing community service uh, without being in the program, that also helps uh, divert things without going uh, through the full process of going through a program. Um, then we have, uh, let me see, so those are other examples. Then we have specialty courts. We have drug courts. Uh, we call them drug treatment courts, DTC, uh, here in uh, North Carolina. But they're designed because some people commit crimes, and the crimes may not be drug crimes, right? They may not have possession of cocaine or something like that. But they may be breaking into houses or stealing from family members or something like that. And, the, and of course, the logical question is, why is this person doing that? Um, it's because they have a crack habit. Um, so, uh, sometimes these people get put and they get diverted to drug courts as an alternative to, to actual sentencing, uh, or sometimes even the prosecution, uh, because we might be able to keep this person from recidivizing if we just get them drug treatment. In other words, they are the person they are on paper. They're doing the things they're doing because they have a problem. Um, so we can try to fix it. Now I, I have a very harsh look at you know a point of view on drug abuse in the criminal justice system i won't and i won't go deep into it but i do um i believe it's a personal you know no one ever uh no drug dealers ever gone up to a drug user and said take my drugs right now or you know drug you know it's one of those markets where literally the buyer um and the consumer controls the market um if if drug dealers were if you want to put drug dealers out of business um make uh if if all the drug abusers or customers didn't go to them anymore, I promise you they would put they would stop selling crack. Um, so literally it is controlled by the consumer. Uh, so these are people who have made decisions as adults to say I want to put this poisonous substance in my body, um, because and generally it's because there's something deeper going on, something happened to them, there's some hurt from the past, something they can't get over, uh, and they feel like abusing drugs is a way to minimize it or take it take it out of their mind. Uh, for a short period of time, I call it like 
uh, short-term suicide. In other words, if I'm high, I can kill myself of that situation until I, until I become sober again and have to live with it until I'm high again. Uh, so it becomes a cycle. And that's how addiction starts. Um, so uh, that, that's what addiction is about. So um, is the court system equipped to fix that? I don't think so. I believe, you know, now they're doing well, right? But just, you know, me, I'm, I'm kind of a, a cynic a little bit. I believe the court system has a little bit of a God complex um, because, you know, no matter what they do, you still can't fix what's going on mentally with what that person has going on. Um, and there, and more than the court system is needed to fix that. That person has to attack these demons themselves. But that's just what I think. But um, one thing the drug court uh, system, a drug treatment court system does is it gives these people um, they, they generally have to come to court every other week. So it gives them stability. So somewhere they got to be. Uh, someone is in their stuff. Uh, they have a probation officer that, that keeps track with them. They got to go to the NA and AA classes. Um, so they get to be around people that are going to hold them accountable. And that's very important. They come back to court every two weeks to be held accountable. How are you doing? How's everything going? So all that matters. So they, they get to be held accountable. And that's the important. You can't get over a drug problem and addiction without someone to hold you accountable. And generally, it'd be good if you could hold yourself accountable, but just by on the basis of having an addiction, there's usually accountability, self-accountability issues anyway. So they need people. They need structure around them to hold them accountable, and that's what drug courts do. Um, and I've, I've sat in on drug courts, and they do work, and they are good. You know, some For some people, um, they don't work, but they don't work for some people because that person generally doesn't want to be there. They're not done um, ruining, essentially ruining their lives with this addiction. Uh, so uh, one one of the key ingredients to drug court working is that this person that's in drug court has to want to be there and be committed to doing what it takes to fix themselves. Um, but drug courts work. Um, uh, then you have domestic violence courts. Um, another These are other specialty courts now. Guilford County does not have a domestic violence court. Uh, we just have our domestic violence cases go in the, in the misdemeanor court with everything else. But uh, Forsyth County, Winston-Salem, they do. Uh, they have a special court that's just for domestic violence. So you have, uh, you know, usually you have your, your d the defendants and the uh, victims can't even sit on the same side of the room. They can't sit together. Um, and this is to keep the defendant from influencing uh, the uh, victim, uh, the alleged victim in the case from... Um, uh, to, keep, to influence them into dismissing the case, um, so they're very, they're very. As a matter of fact, they're very um, strict courts on that. And, and also, if the victim doesn't show up, then a lot of times the victim for not showing up and prosecuting the case is held accountable. Like they, there's a warrant issue for them. Uh, so it's, it's it's serious. They wanted it. So, so now, in my opinion, sometimes these courts are unfair because we have a specialty court that's there just for that. How many of these defendants now we're talking about uh, guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so they're innocent until proven guilty. And there's a high burden of proof, which is guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So you got a lot of people that are probably being convicted on a way lower burden of proof. Uh, and a lot of people who didn't do it, who are probably getting convicted because sometimes the way the court system set up. Am I calling it unfair? Yes, I am. Sometimes it is unfair. Sometimes it's perfect and the, the bad guys get what they deserve. Other times, sometimes the alleged victim might be the bad guy, but they, he or she has been put in a position where they get the leverage of calling the cops first or going and filing charges first. So even though there was no crime committed by a defendant, um, this person is now now has leverage so they can walk into court and, and be a victim. And sometimes there is power in being an alleged victim in court. Now, I want to say there's, there's never powerful. There's never any power in being victimized. I'm not saying that. Uh, and I'm not blaming the victim at all. But what I'm saying is if a person can can get that victim status in court, especially when they're when they haven't been victimized, they now have the power of the prosecutor and the whole criminal justice system on their side to use against this person um, in any way they want to. Um, so it, it, it can it can essentially be used in a uh, retaliatory means. Uh, you might have a baby mom or a baby daddy that's mad, and then and now they got this person on the other side of the court, and they have the weight of the criminal justice system pressed against them. Um, and it's all because they called them cheating. You know what I mean? So um, <laughs> it's crazy, you know, crazy stuff like that. Um, so that's my fear in courts like this: is is the court going to recognize what's going on when it is going on? So 
that that's something to think about. Um, so that, but uh, th- those are domestic violence courts. They, you know, like I said, they do that. They're, they're there just to uh, stop the backlog because a lot of times, because of the backlog in regular district um, misdemeanor courts, and you have domestic violence cases in those courts, <coughs> a lot of times these domestic violence cases don't get heard. It ends up being a backlog where now they can't prosecute it because it's been in court so long. So the domestic violence court allows you is their specialty courts that allow just these cases to be heard so it moves them to the system way faster um because there there is a history of domestic violence people get killed killed over that stuff all the time so if we can get it to court faster get it heard um ha- get it to trial faster we might be able to get some justice and protect victims so you have youth courts and we talked about this uh in juvenile a little bit um in the juvenile chapter um we have uh what we call the youth courts or like the teen courts where you, that's essentially uh, people, the age of the, of the offender, you know, young people get to now judge and talk about the actions and, and help direct the actions of someone that's their age. There is a value in that because it, it allows, uh, as, what's crazy is a lot, sometimes young people, I used to be one, they won't listen to people older than them that have been there and done that, but they'll listen to a person um, that's their same age that says, you know what, that was stupid. You know what I mean? So you'll, you'll be surprised, uh, how sometimes peer review or P or your peers, people in your own age group can direct, can direct your actions, especially when you're young. So, th- so that's what, uh, teen courts and, and, uh, or, or youth courts are used for as well. Um, mental health courts, much like, uh, drug courts, it's all about guiding a person that's been diagnosed with a mental health condition that's now affecting how they're fitting in a society. So in other words, they're getting criminal charges, they're getting in trouble um, because they have a mental health ailment and people don't understand it. You'll be surprised. Um, even cops, people that own restaurants, you got this wino that keeps coming by and he's a nuisance. You call the cops on them every day and you don't realize that the guy might have schizophrenia um, and he needs help and he's off his meds. Uh, so mental health court, mental health courts uh, uh, give these people structure. Now, they usually have to come to court more often than drug court people. They're, they're usually in court like every week. Um, but it's all about med management. They have a, uh, <clears throat> they also have a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a um, probation officer of sorts, someone to watch them and supervise them. Um, they have to go to their uh, mental health evaluations. They have to go to their uh, counseling and stuff like that. But the, it's the court holding them accountable. So it's about accountability. Even for people that may not net because their mental ailment may not necessarily have the most accountability, if you can give them a structure that helps out. So in other words, give them a place to stay, give them a structure, you can help them be become valuable members of society. Because just because you have a mental health ailment does not mean you can't be a valuable member of society. But if you're supposed to be taking medication to help you and you don't, then in that situation, now you're not being a valuable member to society. You're, gonna, you, you're either going to be a nuisance or a danger. Um... <clears throat> All right, there's mental health court. Then there are some places not north. I don't know of any in North Carolina or uh, specific, specifically in Guilford County. You have veterans courts. These are courts designed when you have veteran offenders uh, that, that may have come back from war or come back from active duty, uh, and they lost everything. They don't have everything, so sometimes they may turn to crime. Um, and I believe those people um, do need special treatment. I believe they they've served the country, so why not give them a soft landing, right? Uh, allow them to be able to get uh, infuse themselves back into society if they made a mistake as a veteran. Um, but, you know, just like um, drug courts where they help get these people on the right path, sometimes you got to fix people so that they won't be a nuisance or they won't be a danger to society. Uh, so that's what that's all about. <clears throat> that's chapter 13 in a nutshell. Um, just make sure you read, because like I said, I just breezed over everything, talked about things, but that, but I want you to read the book. Make sure you read, and my, um, uh, my lecture is nothing more than a supplement to your reading, so you gotta read. Uh, so that's chapter 13, and take care.